All right, so this is going to be The Three Persons of the Trinity by Tyler Baker Debunked Part 2. So <clears throat> last time we went over basically the first part of his video here. I'm just going to get right into it. And we see this about God the Father all in Scripture. The next thing is this. God the Father is the head of the Trinity. God the Father is the head of the Trinity. The title God in many cases throughout Scripture will, direct, will directly reference God the Father. So he's saying that there are times where the word God does not reference God the Father. So even by that statement, he's saying that God the Father is not always God. That's modalism. The head of the Trinity. The title God in many cases throughout Scripture will, direct, will directly reference God the Father. That's not true. It's always. God is always the Father without exception. It will direct, directly reference God the Father. And we use that analogy, and we'll kind of look at that again. The reason being, we'll use that analogy just as St. Augustine described, that the closest thing that we can understand on this earth to the one true God is a human person. But nonetheless, notice how he said St. Augustine. That was a Catholic uh, in the fourth century, within the first 50 years of the creation of the Catholic Church. And he is talking about this St. Augustine while pastoring a Baptist church. That's crazy. Yes, the Father. And we use that analogy, and we'll kind of look at that again. The reason being, we'll use that analogy, just as St. Augustine described, that the closest thing that we can understand on this earth to the one true God is a human person. But nonetheless, that falls short. So if you just take it to there, there's definitely going to be errors with that in many different ways. That simplifies the distinction between uh, the members I'll use in this case, not to you know confuse language, the members of the Trinity, the Father, the Word, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, okay? That's the closest thing that we have that we can compare it to. Man, the argument that St. Augustine uses, a powerful argument, is that man, singular... I don't, I don't care what Augustine had to say. So he says, first of all, he said that God the Father is the head of the Trinity. That means he is not co-equal with the Word or the Son or the Holy Ghost. That also means that Jesus is a lesser God than the Father, being subservient and lesser in deity, power, glory, and authority. St. Augustine was a Catholic who believed in work salvation. And he also believed that you must be baptized to have your sins forgiven and remitted. I don't care at all what someone who believes damnable heresy and is burning in hell believes in regards to the nature of Godhead, which is the aspect of the gospel that the Bible says is a great mystery. Why would I care at all? They don't even have the Spirit of God. So why would I consider their opinion to have any sort of merit at all? And why is he talking like a Catholic? God is not Trinity. The Trinity is not God. God is a singular spirit and that God, which is a spirit, was manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, as a man, by the power of his spoken word. He also attacks Genesis 126 because he knows that his heresy falls apart with that verse. If the image of God is that of three members or three distinct persons, then why does it say that Adam was made in the image, likeness, and similitude of God? If the appearance, image, and likeness of God is that of three persons, Adam would have been three people. Also, the Bible says Jesus is the image of God. If God is a three-person image, Jesus should have been three people. It's a stupid heresy that makes no sense, and it's because it was made up by people who didn't know the Bible and they didn't have the spirit, and is being perpetuated by people who are high-minded and proud, who are not operating by the Spirit of God, and do not know the Bible, though they hold themselves as though they're scholarly. 
Tyler Baker holds himself as though he's a scholarly, astute man, but he's a fool who does not know the Bible in regards to the teachings of God's nature or person. At the, the, the one God, Jehovah, God Almighty throughout Scripture, very often you will see uh, God the Father as the head of the Trinity. And then you will have the Word of God, right? Similar unto our Word, but obviously much more uh, complex. God is spirit. He's not a human. So I said in part one that he was misusing and abusing John 4.24. Notice in John 4.24 that it says God is a spirit. And I want to show you something. So I didn't have this ready, so bear with me here. I, I hope that this video doesn't end up being super long. But um, I'll just I'll click it one more time. Yeah, there we go. So notice here you have the New International Version, the New King James Version, and you have the English Standard Version. They all say God is spirit, God is spirit, God is spirit. But notice how the King James Bible explicitly states that God is a spirit. Now, why would it say that God is a spirit? Because it's talking about a person. Because in the prior verse, it says that the Father is a spirit. And it says that they that worship the Father should worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. It's a personal pronoun used to um, talk about a person. That's why it says God is a spirit, because God is a spirit person, and that is the person of the Father. These other translations blaspheme that truth, by saying God is spirit. And that's what Tyler Baker is doing. But no wonder. I mean, no wonder. He has recently attacked the King James Bible on his third podcast with this guy named Brian Ross and is essentially stating that the King James Bible is not 100% the literal word of the living God. It's blasphemy. And then you will have the word of God, right? Similar unto our word, but obviously much more... Uh, complex. God is spirit. He's not a human. Okay. We have the word of God that flows forth from him. And then we have his spirit. That's the best analogy. It's kind of like a human person, but it's much more complex than that. Right. Truly and really the, the way to kind of look at the word person, when we use it like a human person uh, in, in studying the Trinity and studying God is that God as the one God in his being and his essence is greater and more complex than a human person. But in uh, the persons of the Trinity, it's less than a human person. So what does that even mean? You know, obviously God, we're not going to find God's creation. I mean, I get what he's saying, but it's still, it has, it's just a stupid statement. He's above and beyond. Why, like if it's less than a person, why are you using the, the word person? That the Bible... The Bible never says three persons, ever. So if he's admitting that the Word of God and the Father and the Holy Ghost, that they are basically aspects of the one true God, which is a good adjective, or sorry, a good noun to use, aspect, as opposed to persons. He's saying that they're lesser than persons in the sense that person isn't a good definition or word to use to define it then why are you using that word in, uh the persons of the trinity it's less than a human person so you know obviously god we're not going to find god's creator he's above and beyond the world you're not going to find something that's perfect perfectly aligned with the creator itself or it would be creator we are the closest thing to the one god we're made in the image of god okay but Okay, so first of all, the Father is not the head of the Trinity. He is the only God that there is. Less than a human person, meaning less distinct than one person would be from another person. If the members are less than a person and less than the meaning of a member, then why are you using those nouns? Why? This entire series of words is confusing because even he has no idea what he's talking about. Man is made in the image of God, and man is a perfect representation of the Godhead because 
the Godhead was manifest as a man, according to Colossians 2, 9. It says, for in him, that's in the man Christ Jesus, in the Lord Jesus Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we see that the Godhead was manifest as a man. So, of course, man is a perfect representation of the person of God. Otherwise, why did God manifest himself as a man? Why does the Bible say that, that Jesus, the Son of God, is the express image of God's person? If there's more to God than just personhood. I mean, that is a subtle way, and I never caught this when I was writing these notes and listening to it the first time. That is a subtle way to say that God is much more than just the person of Jesus, if you really think about what he's saying. ...aligned with the creator itself, or it would be the creator. We are the closest thing to the one God. We're made in the image of God. Right. That's, that's right. But that contradicts what he had just said. Um, if man wasn't a perfect representation of the image and person of God, then it doesn't make sense that God would be manifest in the flesh. It would be a part of God that was manifest as a man. But we know that that is not the case. And that's really the issue here, isn't it? Trinitarians believe that only the word, which according to them is a third of the totality of the Godhead or what they call the Trinity, therefore only a part of who the full Godhead is, was manifest in the flesh and dwelt among us. Now, they explain that away. They deny that that's the truth. But logically speaking, that, that's what it is. If God is Trinity, and that Trinity is the fullness of God, therefore, one of those three persons is not the totality of God. It is not the totality of the Trinity. Therefore, it would be one-third of the totality of God. But the Bible is clear that the fullness of God was manifest in the flesh and the entirety of who God is experienced death. 1 John 3.16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we know that God is, these three are one. That is the entirety of God that laid down his life for us. In John 4, 24, it says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means that God, which is a spirit, and what is that spirit? That, that one spirit is Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. Excuse me, that, that spirit laid down his life for us when he was in the form of a man. One God, the Father. There is but one God, the Father. Now, I'm not suggesting with that, when I say head, that there is any sort of authority structure within the Trinity. That's not. I'm using that kind of as a way to understand what's revealed to us of the one God. I'm going to let that play one more time. Listen, listen again very carefully. There in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Notice it again. But to us, there is but one God, the Father. There is but one God, the Father the father now i'm not suggesting with that when i say head that there is any sort of authority structure within the trinity that's not i'm using that kind of as a way to understand what's revealed to us of the one god in um the bible the bible but that's what the word head means if by saying that the father is the head of the trinity you're not denoting an authority structure what does the bible mean when it says that christ is the head of the church what is what is the head of your body. It is the control center of your whole body. What does it mean when it says that Christ is the head of all principality and power? Baker is completely contradicting himself because he has absolutely no clue what to believe because he's a backslidden and proud fool whom God has turned into a heretic because of his other heresies that he has refused to repent of. And how ironic is it that he's using the word head? and saying it doesn't denote authority when his false church model, where he has a one-man show operation going on, is in total opposition to Jesus Christ being the head of the church. Tyler Baker has literally stated that he believes that he sits in the seat of Moses. And he also has stated recently 
that he believes that the church has authority um, is a, and I'll use his words. He said that he believes that the church is an other authority. The Bible is the quote final authority, but the church is an other authority. Well, no, that's, it's not another authority. The church enacts the authority of the word of God, the same way that um, my wife is not necessarily another authority um, in the household. She is enacting my authority in the household, right? She's judging after my authority, just the same way that when it comes to the church of God, the church, yes, it's authority being enacted by men, but that is not the authority of men. That is not the authority of the church. The church is enacting the authority of the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ. In the Bible, when Jesus talked about Moses' seat, he said in Matthew 23, 2, that the scribes and Pharisees, that's multiple people, by the way, sit in Moses' seat. That's multiple people sitting in a singular seat. Moses was a representation of Jesus Christ in the wilderness. God said to Moses that Aaron would be unto him as a mouth and that he would be unto Aaron and the people as God. That is the position that Jesus Christ is told to hold in the New Testament church, not the church's pastor. The man sits above rebuke and correction. And if a handful of men in his church got together and refuted his heresies, they would get kicked out and not him. That's why they don't do it. And Tyler Baker is unqualified to even teach in church. And yet he's getting up and dictating the daily goings on in the church. That is why heresy is spreading like wildfire in his congregation. Because false doctrine is a disease. And it's leaven. It spreads rapidly. Um, so let's uh, let's finish up what he has to say here. Reveal, reveals to us that Jehovah... God is Trinity, and it kind of teaches us uh, uh, this in this way. This is why I believe that he's looked at as, as being somewhat of the head. Number one is that everything is positioned and oriented in the Father. Everything flows forth from is positioned and oriented in the Father. Uh, and then uh, um, furthermore, I'll have you turn to 1 Corinthians 1. So I have you kind of uh, staying active there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Um and all that is because he cannot defy his nature. All things are from the Father. All things are from the Father. Even within the Trinity, all things are from the Father. That is the very nature of God. He is Trinity. He never stops being Trinity. Creation, where did creation come from? It came from the Father. You think of the, the laws material and immaterial. All things came from the Father. They came from God. Uh, for all things material and immaterial. Listen again to what he's saying. Creation, where did creation come from? It came from the Father. You think of the, the laws material and immaterial. All things came from the Father. They so he said that all things are created by the Father and that he is the head and that he is the first person of the Trinity and that he is not the second person of the Trinity. I already brought up in Hebrews 1 earlier in my other video that the Father calls the Son the creator of heaven and earth. And in Colossians 1, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. This is, of course, talking about the, the, the Son. It says in verse 15 of Colossians 1, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. That's immaterial and material. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He said earlier on that all things flow from the Father, even in the Trinity. But here it says that all things are consisting uh, from the sun. And that all things visible and invisible were created by the sun, by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So why is he using these analogies and these um, characteristics to single out the father in differentiation from the quote unquote second person? It makes no sense because everything he's saying is attributed to just the, just the father. I'm showing verses that prove that everything he's saying is actually attributed to the son also. But guess what? The son is the everlasting father. Because to us, there is but one God. And that one God is the father. Because there's only one Lord. There's only one God. His spirit and his word are also he himself. And that is not three different people. It is by Jesus Christ that all things consist. Meaning, all things consist of the substance of Christ and his word. So how is Jesus a different person than the Father? Another statement where he is essentially saying that the Father is the only person in his Trinitarian model of God that creates. That's heresy. That's blasphemy. He is denying the Son as creator. He's already stated that Jesus is the second person. So if all creation is done by the first person, then Jesus Christ isn't the creator, is what he's saying. How can any Bible-believing Christian sit in his church? How can anybody with any sort of zeal for the truth listen and tolerate that and not speak up? How can they do it? You know, the prophet Jeremiah tried to forbear preaching the word. He tried to forbear sticking up for the truth, but he said that his word was in me as a burning fire and I could not forbear. Shame on every quote unquote man sitting in his congregation that is too limp wristed to stand up and say something. Oh, well, I don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. I don't want to be kicked out of fellowship. I have children. My children are friends with their children. My wife is friends with their wives. So what, dude? If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Serve God. Find a better church. Find, who cares? Suffer with the children of God. Stop allowing your children and your wife to hear heresy. Stop allowing yourself to financially support a church that is preaching damnable heresy. I just don't understand how any Bible-believing Christian or anyone who is actually zealous for the Word of God can remain in a church like this or be friends with this snake. This is satanic doctrine that he's teaching. And I genuinely pray that anyone within earshot of my voice has their understanding open and is able to discern that what Tyler Baker is teaching is blasphemous heresy. It doesn't matter how nice he is. And like I've said before, I'm sure he's a nice guy. I don't care how professional and articulate he holds himself. What he's teaching is satanic and devilish doctrine. Oh. This is another statement uh, from our statement of faith. One point, this is point one. We believe that there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things. That he is the I am, meaning the eternal source and creator of all that exists and ever will, material and Im immaterial. That God is a spirit, immaterial in nature, and that he is in character, perfect, holy, righteous, just, long-suffering, merciful, and gracious. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, here he is the I am, meaning the eternal God, the Father, from whom are all things. That he is the I am, meaning the eternal source and creator of all. Every single thing that he just said describes Jesus Christ. Every single thing. It, Jesus said in John 8, 58, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. He claimed to be the I am that I am that spake to Moses in Exodus 3.14 from within the burning bush. That's why the Jews were going to kill him. He is claiming to be God. And this guy, every listen to it again. Listen to it again. It's 25 seconds. One point. This is point one. We believe that there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things. That he is the I am, meaning the eternal source and creator of all that exists and ever will, material and Im immaterial. That God is a spirit, immaterial in nature, and that he is in character, perfect, holy, righteous, just, long-suffering, merciful, and gracious. Everything he just described is, is attributed to Jesus Christ. 
everything, everything. There's not one thing that he just described that does not describe Jesus Christ. And you would say, well, well, hold on a second, because he said that that God the Father is a spirit who's immaterial. Jesus Christ is not a spirit that's immaterial. Well, hold on a second. I already showed you Hebrews 7 in my last video that says that he was without father, without mother, without descent, with neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. I already showed you that. But here I'll show you this as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says this of the Jews that do not and cannot understand the Bible. It says in 2 Corinthians 3, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. That's not what Tyler Baker does. I mean, I, that's not why I came here, but um, I have commented on that before in my many heresies of Tyler Baker video. It says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, what is Moses? That's the Old Testament. It's just restating verse 14. It says the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, when what, what is the word it here? It says when it shall turn to the Lord. Well, it's the veil. It says the veil is upon their heart, but when their heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. That's the same thing that it says in the end of verse 14, two verses prior. It's as it says, which veil is done away in Christ when it says when their heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. It's just a restatement. Now, based on this, you can conclude what when it says the Lord in verse 16, it's clearly talking about faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. That is what gives them the Holy Spirit so that they can understand the Bible. Well, look at verse 17. It says now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, if you're a modalist, you'll say, well, in verse 16, when it says Lord, yeah, that's talking about Jesus Christ. But the next verse in verse 17, when it says the Lord, it's talking about the Father or the Holy Ghost because Jesus Christ is not a spirit. Well, that's that's heresy. It clearly says, <laughs> I mean, the Bible says that every knee will, or that every mouth shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ is the Lord. You know, when he was born, it said, you know, which is Christ the Lord. Christ is the Lord. I even I am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior, Isaiah 43, 11. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. Jesus Christ is the Lord God omnipotent. He is the Lord of Lords. He is most certainly the Lord in verse 16 and in verse 17. And to say that he's not the spirit of God is to say that he's not God because God is a spirit. It's satanic doctrine what he's teaching. He's saying that Jesus Christ is not the I am. That's heresy, dude. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And also it says here, um, let's see. He's right in saying that God the Father is the I am. Like, obviously, right? Because the I am denotes that God is the eternal God. The Father is the eternal God. The Father is the only true God. But he's saying that these characteristics are strictly uh, characterizing the Father only. Therefore, he is denying that Jesus, who he calls the second person of the Trinity, is the I am. It's it's heresy beyond belief. It's absolutely disgusting. Let's listen to uh, this marker right here. 12, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 12. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 1 says this. God, <clears throat> obviously referring to the Father, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us, watch this, by his son, 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, watch this, by whom also he made the worlds. Why? Because the Son of God is the Word of God made flesh. So even in that very verse, we see the distinction being drawn between God, who is God the Father, and the Son, or you could even say God, who is God the Father, and the Word of God. It says that God the Father today speaks to us by his Son, and it says also, it's true to say, that God the Father, by the Son, by the Word of God, created the world. God the Father does all things by the Word of God. You're there in Colossians. It's true that Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 is in reference to the Father. But to say that it's not in reference to Jesus is to teach modalism. God is not switching between Father mode, Son mode, and Holy Spirit mode. Every time the word God is mentioned, it's always in reference to all three of them. Even though the second verse says that God is spoken unto us by his Son, that does not mean that the first verse is not in reference to Jesus Christ. Because, listen, if Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 is not talking about Jesus Christ speaking by the prophets, then Jesus Christ is not the God of Israel, and he's not the God of the Old Testament. Because it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. What that's simply describing is that God is speaking through the prophets in different time periods, in different ways, in different manners, in the past, which is the Old Testament, to the fathers, meaning the, I mean, again, this is to the Hebrews, to the fathers, through the prophets. If that's not Jesus Christ, then he's, then Jesus is not the God of Israel, that he, he's not the God of the Old Testament. That's heresy. That's blasphemy and the total denial of the deity of Christ. It is true that Jesus Christ is the word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's right. But according to John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus Christ is also the God who speaks those words. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, right? Because what does it say in John 1.18? It says, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So the word is with God because the word of God is in the bosom of the Father, the same way that your word is in your chest, right? The word is with God, but also the word is God. So not only is Jesus the word coming forth of the mouth of the Father, he is also the God who is speaking forth that word. He's both with God and he, both, and he is God because there's only one God. Deuteronomy chapter 32, which is the Song of Moses, proves that in the end of the world, Jesus Christ will reveal himself to his rebellious people, these Trinitarians, that he is the God who spake this world into existence. Look here. It says, for the Lord shall judge who? His people, and repent himself for his servants, when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left, and he shall say, where are their gods? Notice how that's plural. Where are their gods? Their rocks? No, it doesn't say rocks. It says their rock in whom they trusted. Is that not the Trinitarian God? They believe in three persons that are all co-equally God, but that it's one Jehovah that's Trinity. That's, that verse describes the Trinity. He shall say, where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See now. So he says, see now in reference to his people. He's talking in the end of the world about this doctrine. See now that I, even I, am he. Now. He went from talking about God's plural to referring to himself in the singular. He said, I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. Why is he saying that there's no God with him? Because his people believe in more than one God. Because they're sa he's saying, where are their gods? Plural. Referring to who? The unsaved? The unbeliever? No. 
in regards to his people who have fallen into heresy. It says, where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? See now that I even I am he and there is no God with me. See, they're expecting there to be a God with Jesus. They're expecting Jesus to have someone else with him. But he goes, see now that I even I am he and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. There's nobody else besides Christ. And yet they're looking for a different person. They're looking for two different people. Because they trust in their gods, their rock in whom they trust. And look at Isaiah 52 verses 5 and 6. Which also teaches that God's people will at some point in the future go into captivity. And it tells you why. It's because they're blaspheming God's name, because they're ignorant of his name. It says in verse 5, Now therefore what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? Now, if you know the Bible at all, you should know that this has never happened in history. There has never, ever been a time where God's people have been taken away for naught, for no reason, for essentially no cause. Right? Uh... The Babylonian captivity, when Judah went into Babylon, that wasn't for no reason. The Bible is very clear that it was because of what Manasseh did. Uh, Israel going into Samaria, that is clearly, or Israel going into Assyria and becoming Samaria, that is clearly because they were following after false gods. The diaspora and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, that was clearly for a reason. There has never been a reason, There's, I'm sorry, there's never been a time in history where God's people have been taken away for naught. It says, they that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord. So there are, so you have God's people taken away for essentially no reason, for naught, for no cause, really, right? They're not like, they're not committing adultery. They're not like bowing down to a statue. They're not sacrificing their children in the fire or doing anything like that. They're just lying about God's name continually. It'll tell you that. It says, they that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord. And my name continually every day is blasphemed. There are different ways that you can blaspheme God's name. You can say bad things about God's name. You can lie about God's name. You can attribute things to God's name that are not correct. You can deny things to God's name that are attributed to God's name. And that's really what's going on here. It says in verse 6, Therefore, meaning because his name is continually every day blasphemed, therefore my people shall know my name. What is that insinuating? It's insinuating that God's people don't know his name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. And that is exactly what Baker has gone back into teaching. That the Father is the one who speaks the word. That the Father created all things by the Son, but the Son did not create all things by his word. And that the Son did not create all things by the power of his spoken word. Because they don't. he doesn't believe that the Son is the Father. Even though Isaiah 9, 6 literally says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name, right? My people shall know my name. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Everlast, uh, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. He doesn't believe that the name of the Son is going to be given the title of Everlasting Father. Because he's going, he's gone back into blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ. He's ignorant of God's name. And he says, God the Father, his name is not Jesus Christ. The Son inherited that name from the Father. It's funny, if you had gone a little bit further in Hebrews 1, it would have, he would have read verse 4, which says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by what inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. All the beginning of the book of Hebrews is saying to the Hebrews, by the way, 
is that God used to speak in different time periods and in different ways to men through the prophets, but now is speaking to us by his son. But it's still the father talking. Whether it's through the prophets or through the son, it's the same spirit of God speaking because Jesus is that spirit manifest as a man. And if for him to obtain that name through an inheritance means that somebody else possessed that name first. And it's because the father has the name and the son inherited the name from the father because the flesh and the body and the son of God inherited the name of God. The son of God got the name of God through inheritance because God poured all of who he is into a man. That's why the Bible says that he hath made that man Lord and Christ. Not that Jesus became God. The Bible says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. Okay. It's a great mystery, but Jesus did not become God. Jesus, according to the spirit, is the one true God, but he's also a man. And uh, let's see here. 33. Colossians 1. Look at verse number 12. Colossians chapter number one, verse number 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So he quotes Colossians 1, 12 and 1, 13. Verse 13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So it clearly states that it's the kingdom of the son, correct? So why is it that in the Our Father prayer, why do we say Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? What name? Anyway, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, so on and so forth. It says in that prayer that it's the Father's kingdom. So is it the Father's kingdom or is it the kingdom of the Son of the Father? Which is it? Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So notice the first person, the Father, okay, is doing everything by Jesus Christ. The Father gives us redemption by or in, you could also say, Jesus Christ. The Father reconciles the world to himself by Jesus Christ. The Father creates the world by the Word of God. Repeatedly, we see this language being used over and over and over again. The Father speaks to us today, how? By the Son of God. The Father is the source of all of it, and he does everything that he does by Jesus Christ. Look. So he's saying that, so now he's saying that everything the Father does, specifically in regards to salvation, is done by Jesus Christ. But that's not entirely true. Because in this statement, Tyler Baker is only including the Father and his word or his son. And he's forgetting about the Spirit of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So, the Bible says here that we are saved through sanctification of the Spirit. Now, of course, that happens the moment we believe the truth, right? But my point is, is that what he's saying is hyperbole. It's not entirely true, right? Because, um, yeah, all three aspects, not members or persons, have a role to play in our salvation. And the Father saves us by his Spirit also, the Bible says. So let's move forward a little bit here he's not just located in one spot and uh if it was now i want to include this 
Because in my opinion, this is actually what he's about to say is a pretty accurate description of God in the sense that it's impossible to get one without the other two. So let's listen to what he has to say here. Because what he's about to say, I don't disagree with. It was possible, though. The example that I used, if it was possible to kind of put the Spirit of God in a bottle, kind of trap the Spirit of God in the bottle, it's not like you can have one, you know, the second person in a bottle and not the third person. If you get the second person, you get the first person, the third person. That's how it works. It's the one mind, the one will. It is truly one God. There is the one God, and that is the only God. Second Corinthians 5. So, again, I wanted to include this to be fair. Because that, that's a pretty accurate description of God in the sense that it's impossible to get one without the other two. So why has he been saying this entire sermon that the Father didn't manifest in the flesh and that it was just the Son or the Word? Why is Tyler saying that it's the second person that saves us and not the first and third person also if this bottle analogy is truly what he believes? His logic and understanding are not at all consistent. But to be fair, I do think this is a pretty accurate description. I just don't think he's being consistent whatsoever. And of course, I strongly disagree with using the noun persons. God is triune, 100%. God as a person is the Father. The Father's Word is not a separate or distinct person from Him. It's simply His voice and the things that He says. The Father spake Himself into a body as a man, but remained outside of time at the same time, for lack of a better term. That he, um, but at the same time, he was incarnated as a man living his earthly life. The spirit of the father is the person of the father because someone's spirit is the same person as the body or flesh of that person. The spirit and the flesh are not the same exact substance, however, it is still 100% the same person. God is the exact same way, his word. His spirit and he himself as the father are one person, even though his word and spirit are not exactly the same thing, if that makes sense. It's in third person. This is a way for us to understand the concepts. Like we use all sorts of words to try to better understand, communicate with one another and better understand the Bible, like even the word Trinity, right? You know, how, how much more difficult would it be if we didn't use the word Trinity? If just, and we did that with all sorts of subjects. We have to just quote exactly verbatim what the Bible says in this area, that area. Okay, and it's just a way for us to understand what the inner workings of the Trinity are as revealed in Scripture. First person, second person, third person. First person, Father. He's the source of all things. Second person is the Son of God or the Word of God, and it's how the Father does all things by His Word, by Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I have you turn to the Old Testament first. Go to Isaiah 53. First Thess Sorry about that background noise. Um, my wife is drying some clothes and washing clothes on the other side of where I'm at here in my closet. But anyway, I'm going to try to talk a little bit louder than that. Anyway, the Trinity isn't a word that the Bible uses, but he knows that, which is why he's saying what he's saying here. But I don't agree that we need to use the word Trinity. The Bible literally gives us a word to describe what he's trying to say, and the word is Godhead. The word Trinity and Godhead are not synonyms. Trinity denotes a unity of three persons, members, or beings. The word Godhead denotes the authority and functioning of God and his power. He says first person father, and then describes the distinction of the father from the other two as being the characteristic of all things coming from him. But this is a description of Jesus Christ in Colossians 1. So how does that characteristic make him distinct from the supposed second person of the Godhead? It doesn't. He then says that the second person, or Jesus, namely, is how the Father does all things. Yet that's not even true, because there are plenty of things that God does by the power of his Spirit, separate from the Word of God. And 
he's going to quote First Thessalonians 5. So let, let's hear what he has to say. Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So what I did there was I gave you, um, under the second person of the Trinity, I gave you all the scriptures that state very clearly that all things are from the Father and all things are by the Son. All things are from uh, the Father and all things are by or through the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity. So he quotes 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. To say that salvation comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, and of a truth it does. But to say that God only does things through the word and through Jesus is simply false doctrine. One book over in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, um, which we can turn there really quick. It says, wait, 2 Thessalonians. Oh. I had it, and then I didn't read it. Second <laughs> um, Thessalonians 2 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. The word Spirit is capitalized because it is in reference to God's Spirit, not ours, meaning that it's through our belief in the Word of God in Jesus, and also we are sanctified by the Spirit. So God is saving us not only through Jesus and his word, but also through his spirit. So he's not doing it exclusively through the second person. But again, he's using these words to denote that these are characteristics of the second person that distinguishes the first person from the second person from the third person. But there is no distinguishing outside of you have the father who is the person of God, which the son is the person of the father. You have the word of the Father, which is the word of the Son. And then you have the spirit of the Father, which is the Holy Ghost, which is also the spirit of the Son, it says in Romans 8. So this sermon is dog water. Look at it. And I want you to notice how Jehovah God, the one true God that's speaking in Isaiah 63, he says that he brought salvation to himself by his arm and that he did it by himself. That is truly the one God, the one mind, the one will, and he's the one that uses the word himself. Okay? Now, here's... Amen, dude. Amen. But watch. He's going he's gonna to swing right back into heresy mode. Watch this. And he's the one that uses the word himself. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Um, this is not oneness doctrine. St. Augustine himself, who is considered to be a church father, repeatedly, repeatedly referred to the three members of the Trinity. He used his own language as being God's self, right? And obviously that's not, that would be anachronistic to say that it's new agey, okay? Um, that new, the new age idea didn't. Anachronistic? Bro, what? I'm not even going to pretend to know what the hell that word means. Anachronistic to say that it's new agey, right? And obviously that's not, that would be anachronistic to say that it's new agey, okay? Um, that new, the new age idea didn't, in this form, exist at that time. That's not, he's just using that language as his own kind of language to understand the inner workings of the one God and that it's a singular God. So he would say, you know. So as you saw, he began to speak truthfully about God, right? And how God is one God. He brought salvation unto himself by himself. And then he brings himself back. You can see like a countenance change in his face. Let's go back and actually see if we this can. This is not one, him, one true God that's speaking in Isaiah 60. Because in my opinion, it looks like the Holy Ghost came upon him and he was speaking with power. Just look at this. How Jehovah God, the one true God that's speaking in Isaiah 63, he says that he brought salvation to himself by his arm and that he did it by himself. That is truly the one God, the one mind, the one will, and he's the one that uses the word himself, okay? Now, here's the thing. Uh, so he starts to like semi-smirk, and, and then he goes and does this. Is the word himself, okay? Now, here's the thing. Um, this is not 
oneness doctrine. Saint Augustine. His so, in his desire to not be labeled a oneness doctrine believer, he actually believes in modalism, in Trinitarian modalism, and then he quotes Saint Augustine himself, who is. This is not oneness doctrine. St. Augustine himself, who is considered to be a church father, repeatedly, repeatedly referred to a church father. Yeah, a father of the Catholic church. He's not my church father. I don't believe in the Catholic faith. So why are you calling him a church father when you are the pastor of a Baptist church, dude? Who cares what St. Augustine believes, bro? He's a reprobate. He's burning in hell. He believed you had to be baptized to be saved. He believed in the Eucharist. He believed in sacraments, dude. Who cares what St. Loserstein believed, dude? He's so ashamed of being called oneness, even though Ephesians 4 literally says there's one body, one faith, one spirit, one God, one Lord, one Father. And then he appeals to some unsaved, reprobate, dead devil Roman Catholic false prophet named St. Augustine to prove that he doesn't believe in oneness doctrine. No, you just believe what some spiritless false prophet was saying about Jesus, which is insane. Imagine being a Baptist and thinking Tyler Baker was a good preacher as he appeals to Roman Catholic heretical doctrine and their church fathers and church saints. This is actually crazy. He should be ashamed of himself. New Agers and St. Augustine are all operating by the same spirit, Tyler. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Man, that's crazy, dude. That's actually crazy. If you aren't marveling at that, you're asleep. In the social trinity, why not refer, why not each of, you, you know, the, the three, they can just like swear each other in. You know, that you could do that. What, what would be the problem with that, really? If they have distinct mind, will, and, and emotion, why couldn't one do that to the other? If they can have conversations back and forth and speak to one, one another, I'm not talking about the incarnation. That's a totally different subject. I'm talking about within God's, you know, makeup, for a lack of a better word, within the nature of God. Why couldn't the God of the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 32, when he says, I lift up my hand forever, he says, I swear to myself because there's none greater. There's nobody else that I can swear to. Why not? Why can't the, the word swear him in? Or the Holy Spirit swear him in? Do you know why? Because there's truly one God. Because the Holy Spirit is that one God. Do you know who's lifted up their hand forever? Father, Word, Holy Ghost. That's who. The one Jehovah God. The one God who is Trinity. That is who. Oh, <laughs> I want it so bad to say amen. But then he has to go and use the word Trinity and the word persons. I just don't get why he went backwards into saying that garbage. And he's described throughout this sermon the difference in function between the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Yet the Father is always doing all things because the Father is the only personage of God. The Father does things both by his word and by his spirit. Contrary to what Tyler Baker is saying, who said that the Father only does stuff by his word, which is the second person of the Trinity according to him. The Bible is clear that the Father is the only Lord God and the only person of God, and that his name is Jesus and that the person of the Father incarnated as a man by the power of his spoken word. Yet earlier in this sermon Tyler Baker said that the father wasn't born into the world as a man. That's what he said. He literally said that the father was not begotten. He wasn't born into the world as a man. And yet he just quoted Deuteronomy 32 verse 40, albeit not entirely correct. You know, he said that I lift up my hand forever. No, it says I lift up my hand to heaven. Um, so he, he almost got that right. Um, he was butchering verses right and left uh, in this Perseverance of the Saints sermon and this uh, other sermon. But it says, I lift up my hand to heaven 
and say, I live forever. It doesn't say he lifts up his hand forever. Um, but listen again to what he just said. God, do you know who's lifted up their hand forever? Father, word, Holy Ghost. That's That makes no sense. I mean, he's right. What he just said is 100% biblical, but it doesn't make sense that he's saying this. Why is he saying that? Earlier in this sermon, he said that the father was not born into the world as a man. And yet again, he just quoted Deuteronomy 32, 40, where Christ Jesus lifts up his hand to heaven as being the father who lifted up his hand. So which is it, Tyler? Is it the first person or the second person? He doesn't know. He's confused. Because he's in heresy. Of um, the, the word of God, the son of God, uh, being the way in which how God the Father does all things. By, right? He does all things by Jesus Christ. He does all things by the word of God. <clears throat> Christ is referred to as the arm of the Lord. Notice that that's kind of the analogy there is like a mediating tool. By. What is the arm? You do things by your arms, don't you? When you reach down, you pick things up. Notice it's the mediating tool. Even there we see like these little these little truths being thrown to us about the Trinity before it's fully revealed in the New Testament. So you can still see that, just like we looked at, you know, Genesis. Yeah, that's right. Jesus is called the right arm of the Lord, but you know what you also use things? You use your fingers too. And the Spirit is called the finger of God. And in fact, he's actually going to mention that here shortly. So yeah, Jesus is the right arm of the Lord. And that is a mediating tool. That's the thing that you do things with, but you also do things with your fingers. So to say that the, the word and that the right arm of the Lord, which in his opinion is the second person of the Trinity, that that's the only means by which the Father does things and that the Father doesn't do things by the Spirit, but just by the word, that's foolish. It just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense at all. God speaks his word to command angels and commands things to be so, but without speaking, God also operates by using his Spirit to accomplish things apart from using his word. So again, what he's saying here is not entirely true. Your arm isn't a different person, by the way, than the person to whom that arm belongs. I agree the arm of the Lord is a reference to the man Christ Jesus, but someone's arm is not a different person than the person whose arm it is. 126, where it says, let us make man in our image. Let us go down. So these little things that can be maybe confusing and then it's fully revealed in the Old Test in the New Testament. Jesus is said to be the way to the Father. I want you to think think about that. The Father's the source ultimately that we want to make it to. And Jesus is the way to the Father. He is that mediator there, right? He's So apparently he still believes that in Genesis 1:26, Genesis 3:22 and in Genesis, oh, I don't even have Genesis 3.22 here. In Genesis 3.22, in Genesis 11.7, Isaiah 6.8, that God is speaking to the other persons of the Trinity. Again, I compel you, go and watch this sermon here. Go watch this sermon right here. Let us make man in our image explained. Go watch this sermon on my YouTube channel. It will explain eight months ago. It will explain to you that who he was actually talking to was angels. Because look, I already explained if God said, let us make man in our image and the image of God is that of three persons, then Adam should have been three persons. Um, he said in Genesis 3.22, and the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. We know that the angels know good and evil. Okay, we know we know that. Um, in Genesis eleven seven, it says, go to, let us go down. Now in Genesis 18, when God does actually go down, uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes down with two angels, but here it says, go to, let us go down. That's a command. Go to, that's a, that's a command by your word. So if that's the father speaking to the son and the Holy ghost, that is a command and that proves that the Father has more authority and more power than the other two. That's more than one God. That There's no way around it. 
There's only three times in the Bible where it says, let us go down or who will go for us when God uses the word us. It's Genesis 3.22 when it says, behold, the man has become as one of us. Genesis 1.26 when it says, let us make man in our image. Genesis 12 or 11.7 when it says, go to, let us go down, which proves clearly that he's talking to angels. Otherwise, you have more than one God. How is the Father going to instruct the other two persons of the Trinity and yet be equal with them? How are you going to sit there and say that the Father is co-equal with the Son and co-equal with the Holy Ghost and He's commanding them to do things and they're obeying His Word? That's not equality, my friend. Isaiah 6 a also, when it says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? That, of course, that whole chapter is full of symbology of angels. It talks about seraphim. It calls how there's angels around the throne. It calls uh, God the Lord of hosts. And by the way, there's only one king on that throne. So, you know, there's that. Um, So he says that Jesus is the way to the Father. That's right. But in John 14, Jesus said right after that, that he is the Father to Philip. Let's look at it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. We'll be satisfied if you just show us the Father. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? He's like, what do you want to see, Philip? I'm right here. What are you talking about? Have I been so? He's Philip is asking about the Father, and Jesus begins speaking in the first person. You know why? Because Deuteronomy 32 39, that's why. See now that I, even I, am He, Philip, and there is no God with me, Philip. I kill and I make alive, Philip. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand, Philip. Jesus is the Father, manifest as a man, Philip. Again, in Genesis 1.26, God is talking to angels. Your first thought when I say that is probably to instinctively say angels didn't make men. I covered this earlier, um, to which I would say I agree. However, if you're the head of a construction project and you have workers under you and you give them authority to purchase materials and to use those materials to build something, who is actually buying that stuff? Who's building that project? All authority and all responsibility belongs to you. Therefore, it is you doing it. Even if you have workers beneath you, the same thing with God. If God is giving angels authority, power, and power to execute his will, it's still God doing it. So you might be you might respond by saying, okay, yeah, sure, but there's no way we are made in the image of angels. Have you ever read Ezekiel 1? To which I'd say, yeah, I don't think we look like those angels. But what does the Bible say about the appearance of angels? I already read Daniel earlier. I already read those verses, you know, and in fact, I left out a lot of verses because I have a whole sermon on this. The Bible says it calls Gabriel a man. I believe it's in, uh, well, actually, let me just do this because I, I'm not sure where it is. Yeah, here we go. Daniel 9, 21, it says, yay, whilst I was in uh, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel. Is Gabriel a man? No. No, he is not. He's an angel. He's an archangel. But here it calls him a man. Why? Because he had the appearance of a son of man. That's what the Bible says. We went over this earlier in Gen- uh, Daniel 10. It says uh, right here in Daniel 10, which I read earlier, it says one like the similitude of the sons of men. It says, touched me one like the appearance of a man. So Gabriel, though he was an angel, the man Gabriel is what he's called. Why? Because he was he appears as a man because man and angels and God are all in the same likeness, image and similitude. That's why. But again, I have a 57-minute video on this topic. Go, please, and educate yourself if you desire the knowledge of, uh, of that type of thing. 
what he's teaching here is false. He he's it's just false. Even the man by Jesus Christ. Turn to John 15. We're going to uh, uh, wrap this up here with the third person of the Trinity, who is the Holy Ghost. Man, okay. Uh, repeatedly, the Spirit of God is talked about in the Old Testament over and over again. The Word of God is talked about. There is a distinction that is drawn between the Holy Spirit, also called the Holy Ghost, and God the Father. Okay. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. He is the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit is referred to as He all throughout the Bible. Now, the Spirit is also kind of uh, a few times referred to, it will say itself, but, um, but many times, Jesus Christ. The way we get to God the Father is by Jesus Christ. Turn to John 15. We're going to uh, uh, wrap this up here with the third person of the Trinity, who is the Holy Ghost. Okay. Uh, repeatedly, the Spirit of God is talked about in the Old Testament over and over again. The Word of God is talked about. There is a distinction that is drawn between the Holy Spirit, also called the Holy Ghost, and God the Father. Okay. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. He is the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit is referred to as He all throughout the Bible. Now, the Spirit is also kind of a few times referred to, it will say itself, but, um, but many times... God the Father, I'm sorry, the Spirit is referred to as He as well. So the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, I would say the way to look at the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit is the moving of God. The Holy Spirit is the work of God. You could even say that the Holy Spirit is the action of God throughout the Bible. When God works, He does it by the Word and with the Holy Ghost. And I'll explain that a little bit more deeply. As I said, the analogy, you can think of it like this. The analogy the Bible gives us in Scripture. Okay, so anyway, he claims that there is a distinction between the Holy Spirit and the Father. John 4, 23 says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, because the Father is a spirit. Now, Ephesians 4 says there is only one spirit. But, but the Trinitarian doesn't believe that there's only one spirit. Look here. It says there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. There's only one spirit. So if the Father... The Word and the Holy Ghost are three different spirit entities that are not in any way each other. They're, they have distinctive roles and they're different persons. Then that's more than one God. But here it says God is a spirit and it's referring to the Father, which is the one true God, which is also a spirit. And throughout this sermon, he has said God is spirit. As though he's reading John 4.24 from a perverted Bible translation. The Bible doesn't say God is spirit. The Bible unapolog unapologetically states that God is a spirit. Giving it a numerical value. And that value is one. Which is what it says in Ephesians 4. One spirit. And last but not least, Matthew 1 verse 18 it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of God the Father. I'm sorry. It says she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. I thought that there was a distinction between the Holy Ghost and the Father. I, I thought that God did all things by the word. But here it says that it was Mary. Uh, sorry, it, hold on a second. What is this? So I, didn't didn't he just say that everything is done Works, by the he word? He does it by the word and of God throughout the Bible. When God works, he does it by the word. When God works, he does it by the word. But the Bible says here, 
And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is the power of God. But in Hebrews 1.3 it says that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. So is the word the power or is the Holy Ghost the power? Are they distinct in that regard? And notice how it says the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. That's the Holy Ghost doing this, uh, this action. That is God, through the power of his spirit, performing this. But I thought that, Je- I thought that God only did things through his word. You see what he's, he made this whole sermon to say the three persons, and he's trying to talk about the distinctions between them. But there are, there are no distinctions between them. That because these three are one, the Bible blurs the lines constantly. It says, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That makes the Holy Ghost the father of Jesus Christ. That makes the Holy Ghost the person of God the Father. There are no distinctions at all. Because these three are one. Every time the Bible uses the Lord or God, it is always in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is incarnated by the power of his word. There is only one God. There are not three persons of the Trinity. There is no Trinity. There are There is the Godhead, which consists of the Father, His Word, and His Holy Ghost. And that Godhead was manifest in the flesh as a man. Tyler Baker is a heretic who is not approved of by God. And he's not fit to pastor. He's not fit to teach the Bible. He is a heretic who does not believe the Bible and is clearly not approved of by God. I'm going to do two more verses and then I'll end this video. It says in Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. 1 Corinthians 11.19 says, For there must be. Does it say that there will be? No, it says there must be. That means it's a requirement. There must be also heresies among you. Why? That they which are approved may be made manifest unto you. Sorry, made manifest among you. This proves to anybody who has ears to hear and the spirit to understand. This proves that this man, Tyler Baker, is not approved of by God. He's not. He's not. 